continuing with the series, and sorry Nikita and your parents, you will get a little bit of a disadvantage. We are at the end of a series, uh, which is called The Way, the Knowledge, and the Joy of Salvation. We're in the final stages, which is the joy of salvation. So um, it might be a little bit out of context because you don't have the, um, um, you know, the foundation, the background of uh, where we came from, but um, I'm pretty sure the Lord will um, bring you up to speed in the name of Jesus. Um, let me ask you guys for a little bit church. Church goers? Okay. Yes. So, good, 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 good. Thank you, dear. So we thank God for your lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We are, as I said, in the segment called The Joy of Salvation. It is a wonderful thing, you know, um, God has done so much for us. He has created us. Then we turn against Him. We betray Him by, by going against Him. And betray Him in a, in a radical way that we it separate us from Him. Um, you can imagine you raise your children and then they do something. And, and they do it in such a way that it separates themselves from you. You know, you're going to hear me talk this morning. Relationships are very strong because typically they're, they're, they're blood bond, especially family relationship, they're blood bond. But you're going to find maintaining the relationship or keeping communication open is very challenging. Very challenging. Um, blood binds you, so you'll find when you're reborn with the Lord, the blood of the Lord binds you. But maintaining your relationship with the Lord is extremely fragile. Because you have to understand the, the nuance of it and, and not, how not to violate it. There are many of us have families, we have friends. You can't change them in your family, but you have no interplay with them. And the reason what happened, it's called communion. Communion is constant communication. The, communi the communication got breakdown, and typically because somewhere along the line, one of us violates the rules of maintaining the relationship. Hmm. We enter a relationship by the blood. But it's maintained by how we interplay, by our behavior. Our behavior is what maintains the relationship. A marriage is strong by the covenant, but what maintains it is our behavior. So you might be buying just like by the blood or the covenant into a marriage or into a relationship, but it's not necessarily you're having any communion, any relating um, components. Amen? The joy of salvation deals with your ability, how you behave and live and walk with the Lord. And thank God in His mercy, He know we are not very good at managing our behavior. So He said, I'm not going to leave you as an offering. I'm going to give you paraclesis, the Holy Spirit. And one of His major job is to manage your behavior. Is to keep you from the nature that makes you use inappropriate um, behaviors and to move you in the, in the regenerated nature that would allow you to do things that maintain the communion. We're going to talk and look at that. Last week we looked at um, David, as I said, and I'm do, I'll do a quick little recap because we have a few guests here today. Um, just to bring you up to speed and then we're going to move straight into the word, the joy of salvation. As we've been going through this series and as I've told you already, the blood of Jesus, amen, makes you safe. It's like being born in a family, it makes you a part of that family. When we accept Jesus and accept what he has done for us, his blood makes you safe. Number one from God, or what or the Bible call, or in Christianity we call hell. You won't go to hell. But the word of God is what makes you sure, amen? What makes you sure and confident what Jesus has done and how God has accepted in the name of Jesus. And as we see, the Holy Spirit is what maintains your joy. Joy and the Holy Spirit is inseparable because he has to maintain the communion. The communion. This is what he has to maintain, the relationship between you and God and your fellow, your fellow um, Christians. Amen? Anytime the communion is broke, it falls apart, you're still safe. You're even still safe, but you will have no joy. You will have, you will have joy. The joy will be gone. Sometimes you see in a company, or again, as I said, in family, when your communications are broke down. The company still remains, but with the communication, they can't go forth on whatsoever they were working with until communication can be what? Restored. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. So I want to pick it up just to do a quick little recap on Psalm 51. Uh, I think you guys have the Bible. We use the Amplify Bible. 
just ex expand, expand the verse a little bit or give you a few different way of looking at it? I'm also going to put it up on the screen. Okay, and my wife, beautiful wife, will put up the, all the scriptures on the screen so you can read Father it up there too. David is a man after God's own heart. God raised him, called him, anointed him, and appointed him. He appointed him to be his representative. But David got involved in a series of activities that um, destroyed the communion between he and God. Just like what Adam, Adam and Eve did. Adam and Eve were living with God and they walked with God and they, were, you know, they gardened together, etc. But God tell them, okay, there's one thing you can't do. Because if you do this, this will break the relationship. This will break down the relationship. And if the relationship is break down, you go, we can't go far. It doesn't change God created them. But it changed the way they were moving forward. You see any kind of forward progress or any kind of sustaining of anything successful or meaningful, it takes proper communion, proper relating. Communion is how I relate to you and how you relate to me. You know I mean? The relationship between you and your wife or you and your daughter, this process is called communion, when you can maintain relating you know I mean? ways or nature. Now this process is very fragile, no matter what, you'll be a daughter. But maintaining the related factor, that takes work. You have to be careful what you say to your dad to a certain degree, and you have to be careful. You, you pay attention to what you think, welcome sis, amen? What you say, what you do, to make sure the relating factors are always intact, amen? It does not change the blood bond, but what it changes is the relating nature or factor. So when Adam and Eve decide to disobey God, when God tells them, you can do anything. But if you do this one thing, this will change our communion. This changed the way we interplay. Mm -hmm. You know, there the, 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 the used to be a gentleman on TV. I don't know if he's still there. And, and he had these two words. And I like, I like his context. Anthony Robbins, I'm sure you heard of him. He goes, there are must rules, things that has to happen, and there should rules. Should rules, if, if it happened, it happened. But must rules has to happen what? All the time. If you have a gasoline car, you must put gasoline. You can't put diesel. You have to put gasoline. That's a must rule. Amen? To maintain relationship, there's some must rules that must never ever be violated, ever. Perfect. Does this make sense? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Must rules can never ever. And Adam and Eve, God gave them, he said, one of the must rules is that you can never eat from the tree of good and evil knowledge. Because the day you eat of this, so this is a mushroom, our relationship will die. And you will die. If it doesn't change, I create you. It doesn't change, I love you. But what it will change is the way how we relate to each other. And it did. If you don't have mushrooms, you don't stand for anything. Correct. The mushrooms, they're there to maintain. They don't necessarily establish things, they maintain things. A lot of should rules is when you're trying to establish. We should do it this way, maybe that way. But once it's established to maintain it, there has to be some must rules. Mm -hmm. Amen? These must rules is to maintain, or these must behaviors, call it what you want, or patterns, is to maintain the communion, the relating ability or way to, to maintain the interplay, etc. Amen? In companies, when you start a company, etc. Well, harmony. Yes. Yeah. There are certain things you put in place that has to happen all the time. Perfect. And these are set up. I remember um, reading Donald Trump book and he talked about this. He said, when he became very successful, there was a series of things he used to do all the time. He never missed it. Right. And once he keep doing it, he keep maintaining success. But after he gets successful, he stopped what? Doing them. He went back to rock. Anytime you stop practicing or exercising or executing your muscles, I promise you, you'll feel the effects of it Perfect. in your life. Now, see, I remember you telling me once, say at the K, if you steal from them, it's over. Yeah. You cannot steal from them. If, once you steal, I'm sorry, it's game over. So they're, they're everywhere. Yeah. As I said, the purpose of that is to maintain, maintain the process. Yeah. Amen. These are put in place. God puts them in place. Amen. To maintain. So one of the things, no God, there's, there's two components. First, we have to learn to identify them, but that's not enough. Yeah. 
If you know the scripture, chapter Romans 7, Paul knew the must rule. Paul said the things I don't want to do and I know I shouldn't to do, yet I find myself doing them. Perfect. So he knew what not to do, but he couldn't stop himself from what? Doing it. Doing it. <laughs> and the things I should do that I know. If I don't do this, I won't be able to maintain the relationship. Perfect. He said, I don't do it. And as he looked at himself, he said, I am wretched. Perfect. He said, I, I loathe myself. That word means I hate myself. He goes, I know what, what it takes to maintain the communion, but I don't do it. I know what it takes to destroy the communion, and I do it. He goes, I am baffled. I am confused. Sometimes we see people do things, and we go, man, they must be silly or something. It's not necessarily they're silly or stupid. They can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. Paul was, Paul was, in his day, he was the most, one of the most educated people ever. Exceptionally trained. Yet the Bible record, he couldn't stop doing the things that he knew he shouldn't do. And the things that he should do to maintain the communion, he couldn't bring himself to do it. You ever have to call someone for something you know you should? You know if you don't do this thing or call or be there, it's going to break down the relationship? And you don't do it? Paul was like this. But you don't do it one time, you do it many times. You've seen this, this game, how it's gonna, you know, how it's gonna turn out. You've seen this movie. If I don't come to the mark and execute this, though he's my father, my mother, my sister, this will break down the relationship. But you can't seem to bring yourself. The word sin, we studied this a few weeks ago, you know, which brings debt. Amen? One of the things we know it do is condemn you. Once you, when, once you do something, I mean like you're going to be punished. This is, amen? In its civil sense, that's what it means. Amen? But the other component that it means is to disable you. Sin disables you, weakens you. That you cannot do the things you're supposed to do. So when God tells Adam, do not eat of this tree. Because the day you eat of this tree, it's going to disable you. The things that you know you should do, you won't be able to do it. And the things you know that you're not supposed to do, you're not going to be able to stop yourself. You want to do it, but you can't. The power of sin is to disable the human. Disable them. And the Bible said, all has been disabled. None of us, he said, was operating as we should. Things we should do, we don't do. And things we shouldn't do, we're always doing them. This is the power of sin. It disables you. It brings condemnation. And it disables you that you're not able to operate at an effective state to maintain the communion. Yeah. It disables the proper and in fact enables the improper. Amen. You'll find if sin continues to rule your life, you're going to break your communion with God. With your wife with your husband, with your children, with your brothers, with your sister. It's what we call in the world, you're unreliable. What does that mean? It means you cannot do what it takes to maintain what? The communion, the relating factor. We call someone unreliable, untrustworthy, that does not, let's call it, for lack of a better word, this is a common word in a sense, carry out their part of the relationship to maintain what? The relationship. You understand this process? Sin, this is the power of sin. I'm going to make sure you can't execute the part to maintain the communion. The related factor. Amen? So David had found himself in this situation. Quickly, we're going to just do a recap. We're going to pick it up, Psalms chapter 51 from verse 9. 9 through 12. And David said, Hide your face from my sin. Hide your face from that which bring me judgment. Hide your face from that which disabled me. You got no one to see me like this. I know you didn't make me to walk in condemnation. You didn't make me to be disabled. So please hide your face. You ever see someone that has been disabled, they mess up the relationship, and you come to see them and they go, please go. I can't see you right now. I don't want you to see me like this. So David was in the same state. You know, we like to think the things that happen to us are unique. They're not unique. They've been happening to 
mankind for thousands and thousands of years is just your time. Perfect. It's just your time. You're just here now in this present moment experiencing the same thing that happened to your grandfather and, your grand and so forth. You guys know what's a family curse, right? What's called a family curse? Yes. The same thing that beset the generation before besets the generation now. Yeah. It meaning none of them really know to break the pattern, know to get out of it. The same sin that defeats. And typically why? The same way how your parents used to handle it, they just pass it on to you. So unless you learn a new way, you just respond to it the what? exact same way. So you get the exact result. It's called learn behavior, learn pattern. So you become a family curse or a family blessing because you're, it has been passed on how to handle these kind of situations or circumstances. Unless you change the pattern. You meant this way, but I would say the truth sets you up free. If you understand what it is and how to get around it, and if you have the grace, you should be able to navigate the walls. So David was in this situation. He said, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my guilt and iniquities. So all the things that disable me, don't look at it. He went on to say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, preserving and steadfast spirit within me. He said, I'm going to need a clean heart. He said, you see, your heart is where desires come from. Anything you do, the only reason we are here today, we desire to come before God. God is the one, just like when you tell Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree. He is the one said, two or three of you must come what? Together. Now the only way you're going to do this is what if God can say what he wants. Until my desire is moved to do it, guess what? It's not going to happen. Everything you do begins with what? A desire. Amen? It begins with a desire. Desire then produce or evoke thoughts to accomplish them. Amen? Which also evokes feelings, what it's going to be like. Amen? Which engages the will, your volition, to carry it out. And summon the action necessary. But it begins with desire. So David said, I need a, if you can give me a pure heart, I will have all kind of desires. Pure desires. And if I can have a steadfast spirit, not a fluctuating spirit, the desires will be what? Consistent. You see? So David was brilliant. He thought, I need a clean heart. So the, the pool of things I would want to do, they'll be pure. And I need a spirit that keeps me steady in the way of purity. He said a steadfast spirit. Meaning, keep it steady. Constant. Amen? He said, preserve in a steadfast spirit within me. Correct. Verse 11, he said, cast me not from your present and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So he said, even though I have a pure heart, and a steadfast spirit, I need to stay in your present. Because in God's present, this is what Eden with Adam, where Adam grew up in Eden, it's called a spot within God's present. He goes, I need to stay where things are pure. Perfect. Amen? Atmosphere. I need to stay in an atmosphere conducive of purity and steadiness. Perfect. And he didn't stop there. So he goes, I need a pure heart, I need a steady spirit, I need to stay in your present, and I need your Holy Spirit. How God does everything is through His Holy Spirit. You got the same Holy Spirit that does everything for you. Can He do it for me? It was a brilliant plan. If my desires can be pure, if I can have a steady spirit, if I can be in the presence of God, the environment, and if I can have His Holy Spirit governing the whole process, it will be wonderful. Perfect. Now Jesus, when you believe in Jesus and you become a Christian, He said, I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit. He said, Amen. I will give them a new heart. And a new spirit. But even with this, he said, I'm not going to leave you as an offering. He said, I'm going to send you now Paraclesis, my Holy Spirit that resides in my present, to come and be with you and keep you there. Exactly what David was asking for is what a Christian has. Now, whether the Christian is obedient, this is what the joy of salvation. To know how to stay in this area, this is a different story. If you cannot stay in the presence of God and do not learn how to operate with a pure heart and a steadfast spirit and under the guidance or the leadership of the Holy Spirit, 
You're going to find, you ain't going to experience in the joy of salvation. Salvation means you have been selfish, you have been saved. But you can be saved and not enjoy yourself. Because you violate the presence of God. You don't know how to walk in the pure heart, the steadfast spirit. And you don't know how to walk under the lead. This is what the Bible says, you must be filled and led by the spirit. You don't know how to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So David wanted the joy of salvation. But all the prerequisites have to be in place. Amen? So you went on to say in verse 11, Amen, as I said, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, he went on. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me, Amen? Uphold me with a willing spirit. The joy of salvation will not be restored or maintained unless you learn to operate in these principles. So there's four. Yes. The heart must be pure. Now here it is. None of this you do. God does it. You have to accept it. God is the one who gives you a pure heart. God is the one who gives you a steadfast spirit. Amen. He said he didn't give you a spirit full of fear. God is the one who pulls you into his presence. He said, I have taken you out of the kingdom of darkness and put you into the kingdom of light. And he's the one who gives you his Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the number one thing, as I said, the Holy Spirit, you'll find that it will keep you away from the sinful nature and keep you into the new nature, the holy nature. As the Bible said, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It grieves when you go back to the old nature. Hallelujah. So we see David set up the prerequisite after he falls out of it and ask the Lord how to restore him into this area. You must learn as you learn to walk in the joy of salvation. Anytime you start to lose the joy, one of these is out of place. If you don't do the Holy Spirit, show me where I've gone wrong or which one of this component is not operating as you have set it up. Right. So David left the principles of how to return. Correct. That was brilliant. Mm-hmm. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we look at that last week and then we had look as we see... Um, um, quickly, let's go back to also Acts 13.52. Then let's move forward. Acts 13.52. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Amen. Say amen when we dare. Amen. The Bible and the disciples were continuously filled throughout their soul with the joy and the Holy Spirit. They were always filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Which means their heart maintained purity. They were steady. They were in the presence of God. And they were filled with joy. Amen? And the Holy Spirit. They always had lead. They always had light. And the joy of the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit is there to make sure they don't fall back into the old nature. Amen? And to keep them in the right nature. We're going to continue this morning. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, verse 31. We're still in the book of Acts. 931. 931. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And video, please. Amen. The Bible reads. So the church throughout the whole of Judea and Galilee and, and Samaria had peace and was edified, growing in wisdom, virtue, and piety, and walking in the respect and the reverential fear of the Lord, and in the consolation and exhortation of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit encourages you how to live in peace and how to fear the Lord, how to walk with the Lord properly. The old church. In all the region of Galilee, Judea, Samaria, they had peace and they were edified. They were growing in wisdom and virtue. This is all of the new nature. Why he regenerate you? And walking in respect and reverential fear of the Lord. In the consolation and exhortation of the Holy Spirit. Continued to increase. Amen? And was multiplied. It is the Holy Spirit will teach you how to... Fear and respect the communion. One of the reasons that makes us break our communion, you see, 
our relating with whether it's our wife, our husband, our children, our friends, you do not understand or the Bible, the Bible uses a strong word fear, meaning the relationship is so tender. As I said, we, we have a saying in the West Indies, blood is thicker than water. And what it means, no matter what happened, blood has a way of coming back together. Brothers, we can be fight and no talk for years, but because of the blood, it comes back together. But one word, two brothers can be talking, and they can don't talk for 20 years. You see, so the Bible used the word, you must fear and respect the tenderness of communion. Now because my wife is my wife, I can say anything in any way. If not, I do not understand the importance of maintaining a peaceful or a growing relationship. The Bible teaches in the book of James, you have two ears and one mouth. So what does it say you must do? Listen twice. Listen twice, speak once. Meaning, be careful, as I said, all it takes is one careless desire. One careless thoughts, and you can change the communion in a church, in a marriage, among siblings, between you and God. Does it change who belongs to God? No. Does it change if you're someone, daughter, or son? Does it change that? No. no. But what it changed, you might talk for decades. The interplay. It changes the interplay. There's so many families I know. I'm, I'm a bishop. I talk to families and different. Something you see, brother, sisters, mother, they haven't talked in 20 years, 30 years. One word. Somebody said one careless word. Mm -hmm. It is also why the Lord told you you must forgive. Mm -hmm. It is also, as I said, one of the major purpose of the Holy Spirit, besides teaching you all about the new heart and the steadfast spirit and the ways of our kingdom, it's to make sure. This is right. The Bible said, "Take every thought captive." The Holy Spirit is going to teach you how to manage every thought. He said, "Before any thoughts get out, we have to look at it to make sure they will not destroy what the communion, the relationship, the relationship." Sometimes I plan to say or do something, and I sense the Holy Spirit come up. I go, "No, no, stop, 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 stop." Let's see, let's evaluate this process. Let's evaluate exactly what you're about to do. Will this maintain what? The communion, the relationship. Will this maintain the relationship? Why sometimes I say, just give me some space. I just need a few minutes. I just need to, I need to look at this process properly. I need to make sure. Amen. I have five kids. And sometimes when my kids do certain things, I want to say certain things. But the Holy Spirit will stop me and go, be careful. This will change the relationship. I'll leave it for alone for a while. This has to be dealt with. But I have to deal with it appropriately that it maintain what? The communion. The communion. When your relationship, ever so often I meet Christian and I go, Bishop, I'm praying and God is not answering my prayer. I don't sense his presence anymore. Or my heart is not at peace anymore. I go, okay, let's see what you have done. I know, I tell you right away, you have break what? The communion. You have done something, believe something, desire something, do something that violates the tenderness of the relationship. Not the blood relationship, the relating relationship. The related relationship. That's what changes. So the Bible says, takes every thought, paraclesis, the Holy Spirit is there to go. I'm going to teach you how to manage what you believe, what you think about, what you say, what you do to make sure you do not violate the nuance of their relationship. Show me someone that is careless in how they manifest and interplay with people and, and really maybe even love or value people or their relationship and I'll show you they have no relationship. Yeah. It's not that they don't want it. They can't maintain it. Because to maintain it, the nuance has to be what? Correct. It's so important. If not, once we had believed in Christ and we were saved and we were given a new heart and a new spirit, we would not have need paraclesis. Yeah. The two reasons we need the Holy Spirit. One, the Bible said, you're a child, meaning you're not familiar yet. 
We need it to be enlightened. And the second one, the sentiment needs to be what? Manage. The Bible puts it this way in Philippians. It got make sure every word is seasoned with salt. You know what salt gives? Taste. It must be tasteful. You got no thoughts, no words you say must be not what? Tasteful or appropriate. No inappropriacy. So you see, you make sure before you offer that thing to anyone, especially to God, it is what? Tasteful. Hallelujah. So the old church we can see throughout the realms, the reason they were growing in wisdom and virtue, the Bible said the Holy Spirit that teach them how to walk in the respect and the reverential fear of the Lord. And any kind of consolation, anytime they're going to talk to somebody, it must be in a way, amen, that Edify. I always tell people, people don't need no one tearing them down. Sin does that all by itself. They have a force in this realms that we allow in that will do it all by itself. Most people beat themselves up. They don't need nobody to beat themselves up. They carry it on. And, and they don't understand this principle. Most of you walk with me for a while, so you notice, and you see you're, you've been in the church, you should notice. When God created everything, it was word activated. Just like when you walk through, you went through a mall and you walk to a door. When your presence is there, the, the doors open. Well, vice versa. When God created everything, it's...